Okay, and we are recording. Welcome, everyone, to another episode. Uh, I have a special guest with me. First of all, I should explain the scenery looks a little bit different. I'm not uh, at my usual home studio. I'm in a 21-day quarantine uh, Quarantine after visiting Hong Kong for just two days. I had no choice. I really had to go. So uh, I'm cooped up here, and I'm glad to have Andrew with me, who's going to help me pass some of that time. Uh, so Andrew's a good friend from uh, Australia. We've been, well, online friends for quite a while. And uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about... Um, Mainstream media and propaganda and the different methods uh, they use to really uh, push a story. So I'll, I'll start up by saying um, you, like many of us um, who have kind of gathered online together, uh, have debunked a lot of the stories that are being put out. But you go one step further, which was really interesting for me, was you really analyze the language they're using um, on your on your blogs. You also go into depth where you where you look at the kinds of words they use, the frequency of, uh, uh, of uh, that they use that word, and how are they developing the story to emotionally pull people in, which I think is a really important component as well. Um, but before we get into that, maybe what we'll start with is we'll start with a general uh, kind of introduction. If you want to introduce yourself a little bit about who you are, and uh, we'll go from there. Sure. Um, <clears throat> so I'm a retired teacher. Um, I live in Queensland in Australia. Um, Queensland's a sort of uh, a big state in the in the north, um, and like a lot of countries, um, you know, there's a, a, a certain amount of um, north south um, rivalry, um, and so people in the the south of Australia, um, in New South Wales and Victoria, kind of think Queensland is uh, sort of a little bit odd and maybe have two heads or or, or, mm -hmm. or something like that. Um, so, yeah, um, it's, an, it's a fairly unique place to, to live. Um, yeah, I've, I've, I taught for about 38 years um, and the areas I taught were in um, English and foreign languages um, up until um, they sort of stopped teaching German and then I... I took a, I, I re, um, I retrained and um, I, I, for the last half of my career, I was, I was teaching IT subjects. Um, so, you know, my first, um, my first area, area of expertise is actually languages and language. And okay. I, I think, I think I've, um, I think I've taught probably, you know, uh, well, literally hundreds of classes um, about you know analysing the media and and how the the language works. So it's it's an area where I'm very comfortable talking about it and and analysing uh, texts. Okay. So I'm I'm the sort of person who knows a fair bit about language. I can't really um, I'm I'm not a China expert in any sort of regard. I can't speak Chinese. I've never been to China. I until I started watching Carl Jar's um, uh, podcasts and and YouTube videos, I was really quite ignorant of of Chinese history. So um, yeah, so it's been a, a very much a voyage of discovery. Um, right, yeah, but yeah, so that's where the tie-in is. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, so that, that's where the tie ins I didn't realize there was a tie-in to what you did before. And that might be the interesting piece because for me, what's interesting is most people who don't speak Chinese, haven't been to China, especially in Australia, I find they just kind of fall for the propaganda. So was that the key for you to be able to see through it was the language you could immediately identify and say, hold on a second, there's something funny going on with the way they're framing this. Is that what started uh, the kind of the, the investigation on your part? Um. Possibly not. I think it was. Um, it, it wasn't so much the language. It was the. It was the fact that um, the ABC um, started um, started putting out these virtually every night these news stories about China, and they interviewed the same sort of. You know, they interviewed Aspie and the same sort of people. And it, it, it made me a bit suspicious it, on the whole of what, you know, what's going on here? You know, why are we hearing from this one 
this one group and and actually my first foray into looking at anti-China propaganda was to actually go and have a look at Aspie and I, I got I was really puzzled by the fact that they you know basically boasted about their connection with US arms factories and and as soon as I saw that it was just like what's going on here and um, and shortly after that I you know I, I started watching your YouTube um, channel and Carl Schaas and and it 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 was it was a bit of a revelation really because I'd never heard anyone talk about China like that or or, or um, you know, really present a positive picture of, of China. So right. it was it was it was very interesting for me to start discovering. And around about that same time, I also um, read Sh um, uh, Shashi Tharoor's um, *Inglorious Empire*, which is the mm. story of how the British raped uh, India. You know, India went from being probably the richest country in the world and then 400 years later it's you know it was the yeah, poor really. one of the poorest yeah and you know so the colonial um impact um of the british rule in in india was pretty shocking and I'd, i once again that was something which you know during my education um was basically just ignored um right. so you know <clears throat> um and, and that bothered me because, you know, I, I guess being a teacher of, of um, humanities, you kind of have a, an idea that you, you know, you're, you're re relatively well educated and you should know these things and then just to suddenly find that there's this whole section of, of culture and history and, and, and life that you haven't heard about. Um, it was it was a bit shocking. So that's when I started then to drill down on the actual, um, you know, the work of Aspie. And as soon as I did that, it was just plain as day. Um, you know, if you look at any of Zen's um, right. reports, it's it the it, it stands out like a sore thumb. I mean, he doesn't write like an academic. And and you know, if I if I told my kids to write like he did. Um, and they'd have to sack me. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that, um, so it wasn't necessarily, yeah, so it, it sounds like it wasn't really the, necessarily the language uh, skills that got you into it, but the language skills came later on where you said, okay, let's look at what they're really doing with this, with the language yeah. uh, to push these narratives. Yeah. Um, and yeah. Uh, yeah, I remember one of the first uh, blogs I read from you you looked at, uh, I think it was one of the Aspie reports you tore apart and you looked at the words they used. Yeah. And then, of course, there's a whole additional layer, which you've seen from other people, too, where they then see that, well, actually, you know, the, the, the underlying Chinese documents that they were translating, uh, they were using incorrect translating to begin with. So those were very deliberate yeah. usages of words on their part. Um, now, you've recently yeah. been focusing a bit more on... Uh, uh, actually, no. Before before I go to that, I want to I want to hone in on something because I have a lot of friends in Australia who are equally concerned about what's going on, uh, but they don't dare speak up because the consequences for them, especially if they're younger, are too great. And and, and this is a great irony as well. Like you know, it's supposed to be the, a society with free speech, but they know that there'll be personal and professional consequences for them if they speak up. So my my curiosity question to you is: if you weren't retired yet. And you were you were far off from being retired. Would you be thinking twice about pushing back as much as you are, or being a little bit more careful? Or how do how is, what are your, what are your thoughts on that? Well, yes, I, w I would be a lot more circumspect. Um, it, in in truth, I've always been fairly outspoken. So you know, being outspoken in my workplace has has never really bothered me, uh, and so. So in a way, people would almost expect me to be outspoken, but there was always a um, there was always a, a feeling that you, you know you've got to be careful that you don't over overstep a mark um, in in making comments which are negative, especially uh, about government. And and as a as a teacher, I was constrained by even the um, the you know the um, 
the regulations of the job that I wasn't allowed to speak about, you know, government um, issues um, because I was a public servant and, right. and you're expected to, to basically not have an opinion on that in a public sense. So, <clears throat> yeah, there is a, there's a, to a certain extent, I was, I was far more restrained, um, but I still was fairly actively, you know, in a private way, um, I was still fairly actively um, critical of, you know, a media outlets. Like I've, I've, I've actually written emails to various media organisations, especially the ABC for, for decades. Um, yeah. But I've never been so uh, open about that. And especially I've never been on Twitter, um, you know, making those very public statements. But I feel much bolder now um, mm -hmm. than I am because there isn't that constraint. But I know that there are people who who certainly are, are very concerned about making public statements just because, um, yeah, there's, there's the impact on their employment. Right. I mean, I think and I don't know if in your um, your history um, in Australia, if you've ever seen anything quite like the current environment, because it seems like for me, at least from the outside, that we're in a whole different ball game now where there's a kind of McCarthyism type thing going on where everybody's concerned about Chinese uh, influence there. You know, the, the, the politicians are asking Australian born people of Chinese descent to condemn, you know, uh, the, 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 the Ch Chinese Communist Party. It's like, what, what is going like we're witnessing McCarthyism. So, uh, I mean, maybe that would play. And also you're saying that you were outspoken while you were working. But we're, am I correct in saying that the, the level of paranoia that's going on right now, we haven't really seen before in Australia, this, no. as far as you can remember? No, 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 it's, it's just it's, it's staggering, really, um, the extent to which, you know, the, the, it's just gone essentially hysterical. Um, and, you know, and there doesn't seem to be any break on it, you know, and um, as, you know, the, you, you know, um, Jane Golly, when she dared to go on television and, and, and say, well, is this really a sensible way of dealing with China? You know, I mean, she said nothing really controversial in the end. Uh, but, you know, she basically got stoned. I mean, she, they might as well have all picked up a rock and thrown it at her from the, the, the oh, they pushback. Oh, her. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, 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 I mean, that's insane. You know, I mean, I can't remember a time in Australia where that there was that level of, of just, yeah, like, like you say, McCarthyism. Um, in, in, in the way that people, um, you know, thought about, you know, uh, there's always been, I think, a sense in Australia of, you know, um, a, an anti-US imperial, um, imperialism sort of sentiment. You know, we, we, like a lot of countries, we don't like to be sort of told what to do. Um, and, that, and so there's always been um, a sense of, you know, just what's this thing of America pushing us into wars? Um, there, is a, there, is, there is a sort of resistance in, in Australians to, to that. But right. that, all thing, that all seems to have collapsed in a way in relation to China. Like um, it, it's sort of nobody questions. I mean, this is one of the things that has really bothered me in digging into the ABC is that nobody's... Nobody is asking any questions, uh, even when, you know, the, the things that are said are patently stupid. You know, they, right. they, they're ridiculous statements. And people aren't questioning. And where before you could rely on, you know, at least some journalists asking, you know, very penetrating questions um, about what's, you know, what's going on. Um, that... It's almost like there's this acceptance that you know it's it's free range. You can say whatever you like about China, and and everybody will nod their head, and you know nobody will nobody will raise an argument against it. And it yeah. just I, it, 
it, it really bothers me because it's 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 in Australia. Mm. I think that I I've, I've never really in, encountered. We've always had uh, in the past. I think a fairly robust public debate, but. You know, as far as China's go, it's you know it's unanimous right across the board. You know, academia is full of anti-China sentiment. Um, you know, the politicians on, on both sides of the house are, are anti-China. The even the the crossbenchers are anti-China. I mean, it it, it doesn't matter what um, area you look at in Australian society at the moment, bar you know a few independent journalists. Um, right. Yeah. The, I think, you know, is that the, 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 yeah, sorry. Yeah. I was just going to say, I think the idea of whether um, the, the, the merit of being anti China or not is not something I'm going to get into now, you know, because that's some of the comments I see. Well, it's like, well, we should be anti China. Um, and I can very easily address those issues that, the, that, that bring them yeah. to that conclusion. However, we can just ignore that for now. There should at least be an environment where people can present opposing opinions and it doesn't seem to be that uh, it doesn't seem to be there right now um i want to actually transition if you don't mind uh into the abc a little yes. bit more um because we have yes. some we have some stuff and some clips that we're going to bring up uh about abc but i wanted to ask you first of all how have your um feelings or impressions of the abc developed over time like what was the abc to you before um, have you seen yep. a transition? What, what 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 do you think it is now? Just give us a little bit of background. How, how you feel about the well, the uh, you know, the, most Australians, um, you know, over thirty, uh, grew up with the ABC. It's an it's a national institution, and you know, it's it's considered to be an authoritative source of news and and you know truth, um, and you know so. You know, in, in my household when I was a kid, my father would um, listen to the 7 o'clock news. He, we only had a radio. He, he sort of had very strict religious views that um, meant he didn't have a television. Um, but, you know, at 7 o'clock, the ABC News was on. We, we all had to listen to it. Nobody was allowed to speak because, you know, it was like almost like the word of God was coming to you. You know, and 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 that's that was sort of the position that the ABC occupied. And and as I was growing up, and you know, in I suppose in my early twenties, the world was sort of divided into this commercial TV side, which was you know all the fluff and the sensationalist stuff and the clickbait and you know, well not clickbait, but the uh, equivalent, the equivalent of that of at the it. time. Yeah, yeah, and and. And then there was the ABC and, you know, you got the real stuff from the ABC. Also, you know, a lot of interesting programming. But And then um, over time we had a Prime Minister um, called John Howard who his government basically introduced this idea of, of the way you keep the ABC in check is that you threaten to cut their, their funding. And every government from then on took that lead and it was basically don't criticise us. If you do, we'll cut your funding. And so they, they, they've gone from, I think, being very bold to, to really being, you know, I, I think a lot of ABC journalists are frankly scared of losing their job. Um, and so they they self censor. They don't they don't ask the hard questions. They don't go to places you know subjects which could you know step outside the orthodoxy. But um, the flagship program of of the ABC has always been Four Corners. Four Corners is an investigative journalist journalism, um, you know and. It's 60 years old now, and so I grew up with Four Corners. And in course, we had a, a premier who was basically um, a, a, a tyrant. Um, we were the laughing stock of the country because, you know, when you went to Queensland, it was almost like you went to some sort of tin pot dictatorship. You know, this guy was in power for 32 years from when I was born to when I was 32 and he 
he managed to stay in power. Some years he only got 28% of the vote, but he just gerrymandered himself in into power and his government was totally corrupt. He used the police as his a private, you know, virtually his private political arm. Um, and he had a secret, you know, he had secret police who, who, um, you know, um, you, you could never know who who they were, and um, you know, so just about all dissent um, in Queensland for the the rule of this guy J.B. Oakey Peterson, um, you know, just you you just didn't have a hope, you know, and and in my university years, I I, I went to marches where, you know, the whole thing was that there would be five thousand police and you know. A hundred protesters. We would all get arrested, and you know, it was it was, it was just a, a, this ritual, and um, you know. So, but but we fought for the the freedoms to actually have street marches, um, and we eventually, after a very long time, got that. But that that government was brought down in part, well, not in part, as a result of. Um, a Four Corners investigation into the corruption of that government, and the, that that um, that investigation was was so revealing. It exposed so much of the corruption that they were obliged to have an inquiry, a very famous inquiry called the Fitzgerald Inquiry in, in Queensland, and that Fitzgerald Inquiry then, you know, un dug up a whole lot of of corruption and that corrupt that digging up that corruption ultimately led to to that government falling so that shows you there's some of the the potency of the the of four corners as a real um uh element of you know a real democratic element and a, a uh a holding politicians to account exposing corruption you know um and and putting all that all, all in front of people so that they couldn't ignore it and that was the sort of culture that four corners had then but i look at four corners now and i can't even recognize the same the, the same institution you know um the deep dive I did on the investigation, um, the um, the story that they did on China and about the the um, tariffs the Chinese imposed on Australia, it was just woeful. Like it was nothing like the tenor of what we'd had in in the past from Four Corners, right. especially the sort of Four Corners that we got when, you know, I was in my 20s and, and 30s. So it was almost as if that it's lost any of the of that culture of holding um, governments to account, you know, that all, that sort of culture seems to be lost and it's it just really um, come up with the program where you can get the easiest available person to say something that fits the narrative. You know, and and it's so. But well, for me, it personally, it's disappointing. Um, but yeah, yeah I can imagine. Yeah. Any time I've I've, you know, I've, I've fed back to them. Um, I've emailed them and said, you know, what's going on here about the program? It's not just four corners. It's just sort of waved away as if you know, don't worry about that. Um, and you know, that's also you know fairly disappointing. But anyway, that's um, that's the you know it's, yeah. it's <laughs> it, it must that's be where so I'll, disappointing. I'll, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, I can yeah. imagine like like even like I mean, I, I I grew up listening to a lot of CBC radio programming and stuff like that. Now, I didn't really pay attention to how they covered politics back then, but. Um, looking at the stuff they put out now, um, even for me, and I didn't go through um, a situation where the CBC did something amazing for us like they did, uh, like the ABC did for you to finally get rid of that tyrant of a person. 
Um, and even I'm disappointed when I look at what uh, the CBC puts out and I'm like, really? Like, how shoddy is this work? It was so deliberate. It was so forced. It was so framed. Uh, so I can only begin to imagine um, how you must feel about um, the ABC. Um, you know, yeah. For, 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 yeah. Sorry, did you want to add something? Yeah, well, I was just saying, and, and, and it's not as if, you know, this is just me being a disgruntled old dude. Um, you know, that, that, that sort of change from, you know, investigative reporting to, to almost like a clickbait, clickbait mentality, I mean, that's affirmed by, by the Bill Bertel's speech um, to the China Matters you know, that we've got clips of is that, you know, um, basically he's he's saying that, you know, the sort of journalism you do now is the journalism for, you know, just get it done. Um, don't, you know, don't, don't rock the boat. Don't say anything too controversial. Just stick with the narrative and, um, you know, take something that's relatively mundane, sensationalize, sensationalize it, and 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 that's that's it done. You know, right. so it's not yeah, look, it's not yeah. you know go and have a deep look at what is happening. It's just you know take whatever is easiest to collect at the time and sensationalize it. Yeah, you know what? I mean, I, I watched the speech and you sent me some clips and I looked at your notes on it. And the thing is, I try to put myself in the position of somebody who doesn't know the kinds of um, deceitful coverage that uh, Bill Bertels has already done. From somebody standing on the outside, they'd probably listen to that speech and they'd think, this is a really balanced guy. He knows what's going on. You know, the words he uses, the language he uses, we know better because we've seen him mistranslate stuff deliberately or frame things in really dishonest ways. But when an ordinary person who doesn't know better listens to that speech, they'll be like, oh, yeah, OK, all right. He, he, he knows what's going on. He's trying his best to to work within that system and still bring us honest journalism. But that's not that's not what's going on. So how about we uh, jump into to, to some of those clips, if you don't if you don't mind, if you wanted to add something beforehand. Yeah, set up, sure. uh, the first clip. Yeah. 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 Um, so if you, it, the first clip that you sent me was um, about. Now, the way that you worded it, I don't know if this was the one, I, I, uh, which is I, I could understand how, like I said, people on different sides of um, how much they know about Bill and not would see this very differently. But I think this is the one you mentioned where he talked about uh, the deliberate misrepresentation uh, for the need to sens sensationalize things. Um, or I, I don't know. You know what, let's just play the clip and, and then we'll talk about it afterwards. I'm not exactly sure which one it is. Uh, let's see here. Yep. So I'm watching the BBC and I got a correspondent at the time in 2008 in Beijing. And I turn it on and he's standing there on the most polluted day possible. And, you know, he's standing there saying, with air quality like this, it's no surprise that many athletes are fearful about coming to Beijing for the games. And I'm like, I'm looking out the window and it is beautiful blue sky. It's like the third straight day of it. And I'm thinking this guy is beating it up. He has chosen the most polluted day possible to do this report to make it look as bad as possible. I could see what people were pissed off about. Here's the thing. Seven years later, I get sent back to Beijing, posted for the ABC. And in late 2015, there was this horrendous run of air pollution. And so we're doing a lot of reporting on it. Uh, and I did a piece to camera, which I sent back to the editors, you know, talking about how bad it was and an editor actually rang me up and said can you wait for a more polluted day to go out and reshoot that you're doing this story about how terrible the pollution is and it really doesn't look that bad how do you expect people here to even care about the story so okay <laughs> so i mean I, I, he doesn't i think, I, that I is, think um, sorry yeah I was going to say, I don't, I don't, he didn't say whether he did go back and reshoot that afterwards. I think uh, based on his uh, corporate head office, office telling him to do that, I'm guessing he had to do it. I don't know. I don't know if you remember if he's, he actually clarified whether he followed through on it or not. But what, what are your thoughts on this clip? No. Well, no, I, I, I wouldn't know whether he, he reshot it. But I mean, it affirms, I think, what 
you know, the culture has become at the ABC that that a, an editor can basically, a journalist in the field can, can, you know, say that this is the way things are, but because it's not perceived to, you know, be sensational enough, well, no, no, sorry, that's not the narrative we want to hear about China. And, you know, so, you know, Bill Wirtles may be quite genuine in wanting to bring, you know, the truth, but it looks like from his statement, maybe he spoke a little bit out of turn, said the things that, that weren't meant to be saying it said out loud, but um, it seems that he's saying that, that there's pressure. Now, the other part of that could be that he's simply looking for excuses for why he reports the way that he does, you know, and, and, and you know the the sort of anti-China stuff that he produces, but you know, um, it it does seem to affirm that there is this real culture built into the ABC now, where you know, just get the story that we reckon that Australians want to hear, or it could even be. Just get the story that will affirm the narrative that the ABC wants to spin on China. And I, mean, uh, I, I don't think, think yeah, I, I don't think his editors or his corporate office, looking at his work, he's really good at what he does and framing things in the most negative way possible. I don't think he needs any guidance anymore. I think he's t he's taken this and he's owned it. I mean, this speech isn't from too long ago, if I remember correctly, but. Um, He's trying to present himself from outside of that, but he has become that. He has become that machine. He's been he's become part of that machine, basically. Um, I think this is yeah. a, this is a good point to share. That you had one image you shared with me too. The the Wuhan lab. You know, like you know when 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 this went down. When the when the when when the you know the Wuhan was locked down and everything like that. We had we had really clear days because like I mean Wuhan's pretty good now, anyways, uh, but. It was exceptionally good because all industries shut down. I mean, they would have been, yeah. the, whoever took that picture, they would have been sitting in their hotel room waiting for the right day and said, this is it. This is when we get the shot. Yeah. <laughs> when we go up and get it. Yeah. I mean, the framing, well, the framing is so deliberate. What amazed me about that picture in, on that podcast is that supposedly that um, particular um, uh, part of ABC was meant to be, you know, presenting fairly positive stories um, about China. And, and, in fact, one of the other stories that they did really was um, quite positive, which made me think, well, why the hell would you put that picture, you know, and when there's so many alternatives? And the story itself, why did they, why did they only interview this um, supposed specialist from America who, who, you know, was meant to know all about it. Why was there not, you know, broader investigation of other sources? And, and in that story, what was staggering was that the, the line that, you know, the, the lab theory was given so much airplay, even though the, the, the guy who was talking was saying, oh, we don't have any, any evidence oh, but this is the story. And so they'd actually, they'd actually, um, you know, they'd, they'd given a story which they knew had no credibility and and yet they still framed it as as being, you know, well, it's, it's, it's pretty spooky, this, this Wuhan lab. And they still, they still got this guy to talk at length and, the amazing thing in that one was that they also introduced all these other bits of conspiracy, like, you know, relating it to some Russian poisoning that had occurred or, or some leak from, from Russia. I mean, it had all these elements of a classic conspiracy theory. And, and so I've, I've written that one up in, in one of my AB series. But, you know, I sent them an email just saying, hey, what's, this, what's the story here? How can you possibly give so much airplay to to a conspiracy theory for a start, <clears throat> which in the actual article it says is a whole load of rubbish, um, and give so little time to anyone who would be able to speak against that? I mean, there's 
there's in, in another um, uh, another one of my articles I've I've looked at just that particular um, lab theory and there are a bundle of scientists who they could easily have interviewed who would have just said no it's it's total crap forget it um, right. but they didn't it, because this this story fitted the whole idea of you know of of the anti China narrative that's right. that's now so prevalent I, in, in, yeah. in ABC. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out what would have been going on in the in the back in the background um, if a, a reporter really was given the task of creating this positive story about China. If you know, if either they're like, "What? I'm, I have to write a positive story about China? Nobody's going to read that." And then they, you know, <laughs> they choose on their own to spin it negative. Or even if they were really trying their hardest they still couldn't escape their own bias and the spin that they put on it. Look at these stories that are coming out. The, the, the big joke um, for people who see things from our point of view, I'm sure, sure you've seen it on Twitter, is the at what cost phrase that they always use. No matter what yeah. the positive story is, it's like China is curing cancer quickly, but at what cost? China has eliminated <laughs> poverty, but at what cost? And it's... It, it's yeah. <laughs> It, it shows yeah, up it's, so often, it's, and it's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah, it's it's uh, it's just comical. It yeah. really is. Well, I mean, some of this so that stuff was, is just like Onion News Network level stuff. Yeah, and 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 um, yeah, so that that story um, was one where you know I I gave them some feedback and and just got this. It was basically just waved away, um, even though I gave them the facts. I, I gave them the word count as a graph of of how many, you know, how much time was spent in words of the guy who was you know, expounding upon the lab theory mm -hmm. versus the one voice that said something, um, in, you know, against that. And, you know, there's this little tiny slither of, you know, China gets to defend itself, <clears throat> and the rest of the pie chart is is this guy ex expanding this lab theory, and you know how can you you know? And I said to them, you know, what's the where's the balance in this? You know, why didn't you balance it by going and getting uh, you know a voice which would speak on you know in defence of China, and it was right there obvious in the graph in the counter words so it's not as if they can sort of suddenly deny it and say oh no we're really we you know we got we, that was just the person who was available or whatever no i mean it, it, it's so graphic and over and over again as i'm going into these stories it's this thing that it's all we've got to do you know like this is the story from uh, from four corners um about the um whoops i think i've just yeah I'm, i can still see you i can still hear you yeah i've just got to put you somewhere else and a different screen so um okay. i can open up this one it's holding a tick uh, while, while you're looking there. for that i just want to say that i i have first-hand experience with uh media outlets reaching out to people who uh, uh, disagree with the mainstream media uh kind of uh consensus and when these media outlets reach out to people who support the anti-China narrative, they engage them in really respectful, meaningful ways, asking them about their thoughts, ideas, um, you know, uh, really engaging with their ideas. And when they reach out to uh, somebody who doesn't support the mainstream media narrative, it's, it's, an, it's completely an interrogation. Uh, it's not meaningfully yeah. engaging with their ideas. It's, a, it's an interrogation. Um, it's insulting. It's just, you know, the kinds of questions are like, how does it feel to be a mouthpiece for the the, the, the Beijing government or something like that? Um, yeah. they, they don't. They, they really don't. Across the board, the BBC, uh, Al Jazeera did you know a hit piece on me. Um, um, SCMP in Hong Kong, which a lot of people are surprised by, but is it has a very uh, anti-China kind of um, an angle as well. Uh, a lot of the times, just really shallow questions, which are which are meant to either attack or interrogate. Um, it's 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 so obvious. Yeah. Did you were you looking for something? Did you manage to to, to bring it up? Uh, yeah. Well, um, just going on from the point that you have just made, then is this this yep. attitude that you know you go aggressively on um, 
uh, anybody who 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 speaks against the narrative, but you you basically you you essentially give an open slather or a nice time. I've got a, a perfect example of that, which I wrote up in in um, my part two of the ABC series, where a, uh, a reporter called um, um, Beverly O'Connor um, is interviewing. Um, well, she did two actually. She interviewed Adrian Zenz, and she basically just gave him all the lead questions which he wanted. I mean, I, I guess he actually wrote the questions because he's that sort of character that he, he, he you've got to ask him the question he wants, otherwise he'll just throw a little tantrum and, and, and leave. But she asked him all these questions which led into nicely into the, you know, his spouting all of this stuff about forced labour. And she let him talk for, for minutes on end and the the questions like no, none of the questions that she um, uh, asked really put any pressure on Zen's to justify um, you know, his his line. Like she did, it was not in it was not that hard hitting journalism. But then you go over to somebody like Stan Grant. Stan Grant is you know a fairly famous Australian who's now employed by the ABC. You know, and and he's probably fairly well respected in the in the community in general. Um, and he's he cut his teeth on CNN um, as a China correspondent, and he interviews the a Chinese diplomat. It's all these you know cutting questions, you know, one after another. And the poor diplomat, you know, he's just finished, you know, explaining. Yep, that's it. And then there's another. He's fired another question. You know, it's an attack mode of, right. of journalism, and I'm not saying that that's a bad idea, but it's just that it's this marked difference. Yeah, this marked difference between you know, you give the person who's t who's who's telling the wrong story, you give them lots of airtime, and you allow them to speak, and you you ask them the questions and the right questions, and then you do the attack mode for somebody who's who, uh, who's pushing back on that. And then the same Beverly O'Connor did an interview with um, Adam Turan, which I, I think you know um, he's one of the um, East Turkestan um, sort of online activists. Um, I don't know whether you've come across him before, but um, I've, he, he tweets a lot on on, on Twitter about um, East Turkestan and 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 basically a lot of separatist sort of um, material, and Beverly kind of um, interviewed him, and it was just incredible because um, I'll just give you an example of um, some of the stuff that she that she said like. Adam Turin showed a picture of his father before and after he'd been in, he had allegedly been in the, the um, you know, the concentration camp. And, you know, one, one shows an old bloke and one shows a very sickly old bloke. You know, so it's the classic before and after, look what they did to my father. Now, he didn't even offer any sort of explanation that just said it was a, a you know a terrible thing here have a look at it um so o'connor basically says is there any doubt in your mind that he died as a result of what happened in the camps now he didn't even offer that she just offered that as a question is there any you know any doubt leading in your him, mind yeah. and you know completely leading him to say, oh yeah, yeah, that's the reason. Yeah, and and he didn't offer it, but but so the framing you know, language wise, uh, correct, correct me if I'm wrong. Is yeah. you, you 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 if if they were interviewing someone who they wanted to disprove, the question would then have been, uh, how are you sure that he died as a result of this? If it yeah. was somebody on the wrong side yeah, of the narrative I mean, or something they were trying to cover up. That's right, and or they would ask, you know, what was the doctor's report, or did he have any other underlying conditions, or you know, there would be those sorts of questions, which would be the the sort of, I suppose, the the bread and butter of investigative journalism is that you would really push to find out whether that was the cause, 
and then later on um, uh, she there's an, there's another um, part where he's saying that was um, uh, he, he, Turin's talking about a, 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 a phone call he, he's making with his father or his mother I think and she said oh, I'm at the um, I'm at the police station or but she said a local council officer too and she said the very helpful young guy like you helping so assisting me teaching me not to pick up calls from overseas so obviously you know he, he's he's saying that his mother was very guarded um, about what she could say and so you know somebody being guarded on the phone if right. if they were had some kind of possibility that they might be arrested that would be you know reasonably straightforward but then o'connor comes in with this thing of so it's almost like a coded message to you now <laughs> It's, it's once again that whole kind of conspiracy idea that, you know, um, it, it wasn't just that, you know, you made a call to your mother and she said, look, be careful what you say on the phone, um, you know, because I don't want to get in trouble. It's now a coded message, you right. know, and this is because the only way to talk to people in China is coded messages, you know, like right. I'm now speaking yeah. to you and I've got to use coded messages. It's 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 just yeah. it's such a nonsense. Yeah, and and this really is the sort of question. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. And this yeah. is the sort of question that she's asking. Later on, she says, "Did you see? Do you see what happened to your family as um as some form of ethnic cleansing? You know, and now in 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 the context of of you know the West, if you say ethnic cleansing, you mean you know, something like Bosnia, you know, where there's people just shot and, and mass graves and, and, you know, they dig up thousands of bodies. That's what ethnic cleansing means. So she's asking him, oh, it's ethnic cleansing, you know, this, this horrific genocide. But he actually corrects her. Turin comes back and corrects her and says, no, 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 it's cultural genocide. You know, and, I mean, how blatant can Akuna be about pushing this agenda, please tell me. You know, she's saying, please tell me that it, that it, this internment was ethnic cleansing. You know, and and he says, oh no no. You know, to his credit, Turin just sort of moderates and says, no no, it was cultural genocide. You know, or and you know, he 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 yeah. says it as something yeah. different. That's but, interesting. You know, have, you seen, have you seen? I just want to before I forget this point. Have you seen the behind the scenes? Um, it, there was. It has nothing to do with China. It was with um, a sexual uh, assault allegation, and the news crew in Australia was coaching the the woman who was making the accusations against the the guy about what to say and how to say it. It turned out to. I think it ended up ended up being a hoax, a complete fabrication. But as she was going through. They'd say, well, no, how about you reword it like this? And they got her to re-say it. And after she's finished saying, it's like, how's that? Or should I say it this way? Like the, the journalists were yeah. actually coaching them. So with this, that yeah. it was their kind of their, their passive <clears throat> way of trying to do that. I think the culmination yeah. of this kind of framing and these kinds of tactics has an, an obviously an immense impact on uh, people's minds of, about how they think of certain things. So when people constantly oh. throw these numbers out about, oh, there's, well, look, uh, this country now has, a, you know, 70% of their people uh, have a negative feeling towards China. Yeah, of course they do. <laughs> you know, of course they do. Yeah. This is the system. Oh. Yeah. What I'll, yeah, what I'll do is uh, I'll move. If you, if, you, if you had something else to wrap yeah. up uh, for that one, because I'm, I'm going to have to read, read to my kids actually in 45 minutes. But um, yeah, I, 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 we've got so much to get through. We, we've got another clip. But we'll get through that Bill Bertels thing. Um, and then we yep. can add in some more thoughts on that. So let, let's get to the second sure. clip. We have a to we have a total of um, four clips for him. So I'll play the second one, and we will um, we will go from there. One sec. Well, the first thing to say is that I'm a journalist, uh, and uh, journalists are not business people. We don't make money off being nice and sealing deals, nor are we diplomats. It's not our job to make relationships smooth and mutually beneficial. We get paid, in theory, to cut through the bullshit and present what's happening in the most truthful and relevant way possible. 
But our audience, our editors, our personal experience, our biases all weigh into it. The result being that we don't report in a perfectly nuanced and impartial way. And if we did, if we loaded up every story with caveats to make it as neutral as possible, it would be boring as batshit and you wouldn't read it. So that's, um, it, 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 without paying close attention to it, it sounds reasonable on the surface saying, okay, all right, you got to make it a little bit more entertaining. Uh, but he ends it by trying to neutralize it as much as possible while acknowledging that by saying, we're, we're, we're just not including these caveats, the, these different kind of the fine print. But it goes beyond that, especially when you look at his coverage, when you look at him going through, like, like yeah. uh, uh, Jack James pointed out, one of our friends, walking through yeah. and saying oh look they're still selling uh plastic pellets and it clearly says on the bags that it was duck feed for example he goes beyond just not including the fine print he completely manufactures it, invisible stories it's just this convenient excuse that you know um you know i've i've, I've, I've got to be able to entertain the audience so therefore i've got a spin a yarn I, I can't give you the nuanced story but, you know, I, in my mind, that goes completely against the whole point of why we ha ever had an ABC. You know, the whole idea was an ABC was that if you wanted to get the fluff, if you just wanted to get the entertainment, you could switch channels, you know. But the reason why you had the ABC was because we thought it was an important source of, you know, real news. The, the, we were going to hear the nuanced um, version of things, you know, and when you have long form um, uh, formats like like um, Four Corners, where they've got an hour to develop um, a story, and and that story they can put nuance in, that's when they should be almost obliged to put in the caveats, to put in the things that 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 um, could show, you know, something alternative to to the narrative but even in the four corners program and i've broken that down in in you know great detail in in um, that article that i i i did on um in my abc series is that you know there were so many other sources that they could have consulted to tell a a balanced and nuanced story, a story where they could introduce a, f a few of the caveats. They could, and, and they've got the long form format there to do it. That's why you have these these long programs because people are watching them because they don't want just the, you know, the, the, the two minute bite. They want a, a real, they want the journalists to really dig into the story. But as I've demonstrated in, in that um, Four Corners uh, program, The Poking the Dragon, there were so many places where they could have consulted or they could have done some investigation, sort of investigation that I did in five or ten minutes um, to find um, people who would give a different perspective and probably a more useful perspective because Australians do want to know why it appears that China is whacking them over the head all of the time and they want to know what the deal is. You know, why why are there these these these, these tariffs, these trade sanctions, these these problems with our relationship with China? So they want a, a an outlet like the ABC to do their job. I mean, that's why I pay them. They're a public broadcaster. They, I own them and that should be doing things that benefit me. And and the Four Corners, um, that, that poking the dragon was just woeful in terms of, um, of you know, it was, it was a, a nice story about how sad it was for a whole lot of farmers and I, I live in a rural area, so I totally under, understand the sentiments. But if you're looking at, you know, the relationships, you know, the, the geopolitical interactions between two countries, that's where you've got to get real people who really know their stuff. You've got to go and talk to, to diplomats.
You know, you've got to say, is this the way these two countries should have been interacting? You've got to go and get experts. But instead, they picked probably of all of the people to, you know, give the expert opinion, they, they, um, they got one academic called Rory Metcalf and he, you know, I've got no beef with him, but, you know, he, he's known to be staunchly anti-China. I mean, he's, he's got the, as I've put in the article, he's got the, the record of, you know, the things that he's, he's said against China. I mean, he's always got um, plausible deniability in there, but, but you know, he's, he's an academic who, who they know would have said the right things, so they got him. But, you know, there was dozens of others that they could have and I've, you know, I've put them in the, the article. And it wasn't as if I had to, you know, spend weeks investigating that. Um, you know, our, our previous, um, in our previous government, the, the foreign minister, Julie Bishop, she had a completely different view of, you know, how America was interacting with China than what was presented on the show. They could have easily asked her. And I mean, she's no China. She doesn't love yeah. China, you know. I mean, she, she's had all sorts of stouches with China, you, you, you but know, it would have you, just you, given yeah. a nuanced view. Yeah. And you know, and it was when, and so, sorry, yeah, yeah. I was, I just sorry, yeah, sorry that, to interrupt you because uh, we got a few clips, I, but no. and and I'm going to really recommend that people go to your uh, blog to see it because there's going to be a lot of stuff that we don't get into because you go into a level of depth yeah. there that is really better for a uh, written format. But to pick up on a couple of things you yeah. said. You know, um, finding that person that has all of the right anti-China talking points is a global phenomena for mainstream media. You know Azim Khan. He's the Uyghur who lives in, in Pakistan, who fights back against the uh, uh, the pro anti, anti-China propaganda. And he's just removed off of Twitter. He's banned off of Twitter over and over and over again for standing up for China. And when the BBC or when somebody goes to... Uh, Pakistan to get uh, uh, Pakistani Uyghur opinions, they don't go to the vibrant community of Uyghurs who have no problem with China and whose family members are living in China and, and prospering, and many there are. They keep going to one guy, Umar Khan, just one guy, because he yeah. has all of the right anti-China talking points. And surprise, surprise, he's connected with the World Uyghur Congress or one of the uh, NED connected groups in the U.S. It's like this yeah. is what happens over and over again. And when you are have the situation in Australia, when everything is so one sided, when finally somebody like Jane Gawley, for example, popped up, they yeah. should have celebrated. They said, oh, finally, we were waiting for somebody. We were waiting for somebody to have a deferring opinion so so we can bring different ideas on this program and have maybe even a debate, maybe even some counterpoints to add in. But what they do yep. is they shut these people down. And I'm going to get into that in a minute where mm. this isn't just a matter of journalists missing an opportunity to talk to a lot of people who have many things to say but are too afraid to say it because the environment doesn't exist for it. It's a matter of these journalists actually actively perpetuating and, and, and creating this environment, which I'll get into in a second. But let, let, let's jump into the next clip before we run out of time so we can get through, uh, through all of these, if, if you're okay with that. Then there's the ethno-nationalism of the Chinese state. Now, long term, this perhaps makes me more uneasy than anything else, because ideas that are being pushed by the state around ethnicity in China today appear to be moving in the opposite directions to ideas about multiculturalism here. With 92% of the population being Han, it's not surprising that ethnicity and nationhood are deeply intertwined in China. And it's kind of a common thing up in Northeast Asia. Western nations, including colonial ones like Australia, are very familiar with these ideas, having implemented discriminatory policies in the past, not to mention the treatment of indigenous Australians. But in recent decades, Western nations have been moving towards the idea that your ethnicity does not determine your nationality or your political loyalty. And however imperfect efforts have been to embrace immigration and multiculturalism, these concepts are mainstream here. Parties like Pauline Hanson's don't win majorities at federal elections. People have largely embraced these concepts and this is despite constant debates and discrimination and flare-ups of intolerance. China at the moment 
is the opposite to all this. I mean, you know what? The, the, you, you've, you've seen enough of the facts on the ground. I'm glad you, this is a clip that you uh, selected out and I'm really glad you did it because this goes right into showing that no, he's not balanced. He's not going to talk about the robust uh, kind of um, uh, programs, uh, affirmative action programs that exist for ethnic minorities in China. He's going to spin this tale that, 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 that goes into this whole cultural genocide narrative, even though the, the cultures of so many ethnic groups in China have been preserved even better than in their homelands, where Kyrgyz, Kyrgyz people in China speak their own language. While, meanwhile, back home, they're speaking Russian, where in Inner Mongolia, they're still using their original characters. And in Mongolia, they're not even using the original uh, Mongolian yes. characters. Uh, this guy I mean, was in China long enough to know that this is a, a BS narrative and, and then to frame it in the sense that Australia is better than China when Australia is still involved in neo-colonial list projects all around the world where we're still reconciling with what happened in East Timor. I mean, the nerve. Uh, what, what, <laughs> yeah, I mean, this, uh, uh, like you, this one was like, I was totally gobsmacked. And, and, you know, because I know the Australian situation, like, I mean, this is bullshit not only from the point that you've made, but it's bullshit from the point of view of believing that we've done so well in multiculturalism. Like, when I was studying, you know, about 40 years ago, I studied under a fellow called um, Dr. David in Ingram, and he was trying to put together the Australian national language policy. And his basic idea was we had this great resource in Australia of all of these people who, who spoke different languages, um, you know, and the biggest group of them were actually Mandarin-speaking Chinese. And he said, look, it's proven that... Um, if you have a child who who learns a second language, it doesn't matter whether that's their parents' language or not, they will perform academically better. And he, you know, he this was his whole area of of, of expertise. And and he basically tried to set up for Australia, this is 40 years ago, a national language policy whereby every Australian child would be able to get instruction in a different language complete immersion and and every place that was tried you know and that was precious few every place that was tried where they you know if you um, so, so for example down the road is one of the success stories in a place called Stanthorpe in Queensland where they took the whole all the students in the school regardless of whether they had Italian heritage they took their maths science history and geography and they did that in Italian and all of the kids perform academically better they have there's no impediment to them learning the, the, those core subjects and at the same time they learn a second language so this guy is saying 40 years ago that this is what should happen well it just didn't you know and as you, you you will know, you know, from your experience of being in China, if you want to maintain a, um, a culture, language is absolutely integral to it. So if we really wanted to honour our, our, the, the multi-cultures that we have, we would have done something about Ingram's national language policy 40 years ago but it's basically been shelved by every government and there's these little pockets of places where, you know, if there's a local um, Italian community, they might offer Italian at the school or, or whatever. But there's none of that really honouring the, the, the heritage in the language. You know, we've, right. we've, got, we've got a huge community of Sudanese in Australia and they all speak Arabic. And, you know, this is a perfect opportunity to, to get that immersion happening. But what do we do? We, we don't care. We just piss that away. You know, the next generation will not, they'll only speak um, English. I mean, 
this idea that uh, Australia is multicultural, we're, we're Anglo-centric. We're, we're way, way more Anglo-centric than, than, and our whole history has been. I mean, really, Bill Birdle's ought to go and, and check out the Racism No Way um, webpage, which has a list of all Australia's, you know, racist um, policies for the last 100 years. And to imagine that we can be held up as some kind of shining example of of multiculturalism, and you know, yeah. it's, it's so, just, so with, with, it's yeah, just with his bullshit. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Well, I mean, he does frame it in the sense that he tries to add in, so he doesn't sound as ridiculous. Um, these you know you know little notes about okay you know we still have issues but at least we're trying at least we're moving in the right direction but even when you compare it on the same scale as uh, how china embraces and tries to uplift their minority cultures when you cut through all of the propaganda bs no no i mean on, on the and I, I don't know i'm not sure I've, I've been to australia once on on your uh money on your on your currency do you have any of the aboriginal script or culture on the on the on any of the no. currency or no. uh, not not at all no. It, it, no. so uh, i mean i mean in china it, in china we've got the uyghur script we've got the tibetan script we've got mongol maybe something else also i can't remember exactly i probably have a bill somewhere yeah. here but um yeah like even even on the on the cash I, I, we never use cash here anymore but i've got like a little i've got like some cash folded up in my wallet here just in case I ever need it for parking or something. Yeah. So one, two, three, four, five. Uh, well, that's including pinging different kinds of script right on the, right on the, on the I don't think it's yeah. going to focus. But mean, anyways, anyways. It, it, um, it's, it's staggering. And, and uh, that, that it really is, uh, yeah, it shows it, it, you know, the average Australian is not going to be able to argue with Bill Birdles. Right. They're going to say, they're, they're going to accept oh. that, oh, he's been to China, he's been a journalist, he knows what he's talking about. They're not going to know the facts and they're also not going to know the facts, the historical facts about a lot of the historical facts about Australian and, and multiculturalism. Because I, I, I guess that's those, the risk then, isn't it? Yeah, because that's almost like yeah. he's being an apologist. He's being an apologist for it, suing, so saying, "You know what? Don't worry, guys. We're moving in the right direction. We're not that bad." It's like, yeah. no, actually, if you look at the living standards, uh, the infant mortality rates, if you look at the uh, social differences between the Aboriginal groups and everybody else, no, no, yeah. you're not. You you shouldn't be patting your back your, yourself on the back at all. And if people really no. think that, actually, no, you're not doing better than China. They, people should be outright shocked, but they're trusting this guy and, who flew over to China and came back and said, "Don't worry, guys, we're moving in the right direction." Come on. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's 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 outrageous that he gets away with that. It really is. <laughs> yeah. You know. Let, 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 yeah. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, yeah. Uh, let, let's let's pull, play. Sorry to keep cutting you off here. I'm I'm trying to make sure we get this within um, with our time. Yeah. Um, so we'll we played three clips so far, right? So we'll move to the we'll move to the fourth clip here. One sec. There's also been a fair bit of reporting out of Canberra in recent years that appears to take the word of Australia's security agencies or government sources or even U.S. sources at face value. Things like secret dossiers about Wuhan labs or databases of Communist Party members, or supposed spies seeking to defect. It's not that these stories shouldn't be done. They should if they have merit. But the sources pushing these stories, their motivations need to be questioned too. And it's not good enough to prepare it all from their perspective, and, or maybe the perspective of someone at Aspie, and then at the last minute, ring up the Chinese embassy in Canberra and say, hey, have you got any comment? Just to try and balance the story up. This is interesting because he knows he knows what's going on. Um, he he recognizes it, um, it, but he 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 participates in the same kind of thing, trying to catch people off guard, last minute kind of. You know, he wants to frame his stories the way he does. And the bigger question is: All right, so so for my audience, most of them already know, Aspie is the think tank in Australia, which is funded by various governments, including the U.S. State Department and also the military industrial complex. They make China threat stories, um, and then they sell China threat prevention weapons to the government. Surprise, surprise! It's the most scary. 
uh, ridiculous conflict of interest in uh, a, a, in an organization that affects public policy and opinion uh, that has ever existed. But the bigger question is, yeah. what what has he actually done to hold them accountable now that he's recognized this as an issue? Nothing. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, this is the this is the problem. He I mean, he can't wriggle out of this. He has shown there that he understands the modus operandi, you know, the, mm -hmm. the, the Aspie, what Aspie is about. And yet how can, you know, how can we reconcile that with the fact that the ABC, there was a time, that, I mean, this is the thing that originally got me suspicious is that there was a time when basically every night on the news there was an interview with somebody at Aspie or quoting an Aspie report or, you know, it was Aspie, 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 and ad nauseum. You know, you couldn't, and I even challenged my family, you know, find me the day when we're not going to have an anti-China Aspie story. Well, if he's alert as most people in the ABC will be. If he's alert to the fact that, you know, they're spinning these stories and he, you know, he's he's cr critiquing that, then, yeah, like you say, why isn't he holding, like why haven't we had a Four Corners program I've, I've about bloody aspects? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> I've got something really good for you because I managed to get into a conversation with an ABC journalist about this and eventually they just had uh -huh. to disengage. I wasn't rude. I wasn't I, I was really I was really excited and eager uh, to hear their um, uh, their perspective, as I'm sure you were when you send emails to the ABC. So I was like, this is amazing. They're actually replying. Now we're going to get to the, you know, these questions, these burning questions, but obviously they disengaged after a certain point when you ask the really difficult question. So this is, uh, let me pull this up here and see what we've got here. I'll start with showing you who was involved in this story. So there were two ABC journalists. One was uh, James Glenday. It started with his tweet. Um, so he's from the ABC and then also, uh, yep. Sioban Hino. I don't know if I pronounced that correctly. I apologize. Siobhan. If I haven't. Siobhan. Yeah. Siobhan. Siobhan. Okay. Per perfect. Perfect. Okay. So it started out with, uh, James saying hilarious. Aspie said today, if you speak to us, you'll get attacked on social media by trolls next minute. Okay. Yeah. So then somebody yeah, brought up some serious issues and then, uh, so, so, so sorry, one more time. How do you pronounce that? Soban. Siobhan. Siobhan. Okay, Siobhan. Siobhan is an Irish name. Okay, got Siobhan. it. Okay. Um, Nothing like what it's yeah. written. Yeah. So it, it, what she says is, yes, welcome. Just don't stray into Asian border conflict reporting. That gets Chinese and Indian nationalist trolls sliding into your DMs simultaneously. Um, and then, so somebody who uh, you might also be following, also from Australia, said, "Have you considered that the reason yeah. you defend Aspie comes from your own your own nationalism?" Great question. And then, so ah, but neither of us did. The whole point is to seek out varied, often opposing viewpoints, with uh, you know, little just to posting to get it, it gets life boring very fast. This is interesting. No, you always go for the <laughs> Aspie style kind of you know, yeah. um, not varying points. So I, I replied, I said, I noticed uh, one of your tweets talking about how China influences public opinion. In your search for varied and often opposing viewpoints, have you posted about the American military industrial complex influencing Australian public opinion yet? Or is this something coming soon? She says, yeah, many times, uh, not just public opinion, but political decisions, too. Again, very, very, very aware before I get to the next thing, very aware that Aspie is a military industrial complex funded outlet affecting political decisions in Australia. Yep. And then, um, so I say, I'm genuinely surprised and I'm also delighted to hear that. You probably picked up on the pessimistic tone of my question, for which I apologize. Would you mind sending me one of your ABC pieces on this topic or let me know what keywords I can find it under? So I didn't get a reply and she moved on the next day to replying to other people and other things. So it was clear it wasn't going anywhere. So 
I said, uh, hi, and I tagged them, bumping this just in case you didn't see. My community always felt the ABC not only didn't hold Aspie accountable, but actively helped them influence public opinion. Sharing the article you mentioned would help correct these misconceptions. She never replied to me directly, but um, somebody else said, did you see this article? And this is uh, Peter Cronell, who did a great article on the topic. Um, and she did respond to this person under my under my tweet and said, uh, yes, it's an interesting piece and makes a particularly good point about uh, comparative scale. Any scholar of war will tell you that disinfo, propaganda and deception are as old as war itself. They are ageless uh, strategies. Sometimes reporting focuses on tactics without that context. And of course, the media or platforms that preceded in earlier ages, what we now call the media, have always been part of that attempt to uh, exert or disrupt uh, influence and information, whether willingly or not. So then uh, I, she, it was clear she wasn't going to engage with me anymore. She was engaging with other people. So, I mean, I asked, I said, may I ask, from the perspective of being inside, do you feel many Australian mainstream media journalists toe the U.S. propaganda line because A, they know it's the only way to get ahead, or B, there's a natural pre-existing prejudice against China, or C, only journalists with the right opinion get ahead? And then I put this video in for context, which I will play now. How, how, can, you, how can you know that I'm self-censoring? How can you I know that you're journalists are self-censoring? I'm sure you believe everything you're saying. But what I'm saying is if you believe something different, you wouldn't be sitting where you're sitting. So that that basically talking about how the only the right people are cultivated. Um, you either have to already have the right opinions uh, or you have to learn very quickly what the right opinions are to get ahead. So um, she did respond to that and then said, hey, Daniel, I think most domestic AU journals are more interested in drilling into AU government mill actions more than U.S. ones. Some have been quite uh, dogged on that front, i.e. Afghan file reports and the media culture here tends towards questioning power rather than fearing it. The, the, the text is really small on my screen here. I'm trying to make sure I'm reading it right here. Um, thanks for your reply. Yeah. Would I be accurate to say Aussie MSM, uh, mainstream media, is more interested in drilling into China than it is the U.S., despite that the U it's the U.S. that screwed over Aussie democracy and it's actually America with problem the problematic think tanks like Aspie influencing Aussie public opinion? And then I didn't get a response. She continued on to other things. So a few days later, I said, uh, so I just said directly, I said, hi, are there certain questions or topics the ABC prohibits you from engaging in, such as the Australian US media alignment on China I asked about, or journalists will self-censor as they know which topics, problems to avoid in order to get ahead in the industry? I didn't, I didn't get any responses after that because based on her own logic, those are the questions to ask them. Well, th isn't this the obvious thing that you should be talking about? Uh, based on uh, not only the logic that you've presented before me, but your awareness of how problematic the situation is. And it's just not, yeah. it's just not happening. I mean, when, when there's this hysteria in Australia about foreign interference from China, you know, to the point where there's this McCarthyist law being introduced that is asking basically universities to dob in you know, well, either you know, everybody's got to give an account of of their connections with China. I mean, that's basically what the law is requiring of universities. So, you know, if you happen to be a PhD student and you're, you're um, funded by a, a pharmaceutical company in China, you've got to declare that. And you know, what are your connections? And it's so close to the whole thing of you know, are you a member of the Communist Party, the Chinese Communist Party? It's so close to that mentality. Um, yeah. With you know, there's hysteria about about the foreign interference, but at the same time, we've got this blatant, obvious, bold uh, interference from the US in, in, in our, our defence policy. I mean, you can trace a line between Aspie's, you know, white papers, all of all their sort of reports, to defence policy and defence spending. Yeah. Why has there not been, why, don't, why don't, haven't we got the Four Corners program that digs into deep into Aspie and really puts them through the ringer. You know, why hasn't that been done? 
because that would actually be about foreign interference. That would be about another government which is supporting industries in their own country to the detriment of of our country. You know, right, and yeah. but and, and I don't know whether they ever intend be, to um, you know go down that line because. All of the indications, like all of the studies, and you know, you're right. We won't get to to all of them, yeah. but all of the studies yeah. that I'm looking at, there, it's a, a clear and blatant policy. You know, I'm I'm going to continue that series on, and just show in black and white. You know, there's the examples of, you know, when they when they look at a cartoonist who is um, um, anti-China. They give him the the he's a hero treatment. When they look at a, yeah. a Chinese, um, yeah, that's the guy, Buddy Buddy um, Buddy Q, Yuko, I, yeah. I, don't, I can't quite pronounce his name, but you know, if you, I, I did, I've done a detailed analysis of the language in that, and it's basically like chalk and cheese. This is not something that they can just wriggle out and say, oh, well, Very you know, good. it was sort of slightly negative or so, slightly positive. They set one person up as a hero and he's doing exactly the same thing. He's doing controversial cartoons. You know, they're both doing controversial cartoons. They're both offending people. They're both doing their job as cartoonists. They're both getting up the noses of authorities. But if it's China, if it's pro China, you use all of this, you know, nice, you know, uh, language of you know that that, that basically molly molly coddles that side, and if it's um, pro China, yeah. all yeah. all of the Anti-China language is completely yeah. Yeah. pejorative, you know, and and yeah. it's so yeah. obvious. And the more I've looked, you know, I keep I keep pulling up these. You know, there's one um, article about uh, the uh, investigation that the 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 Chinese did of Jack Ma. Um, I think we've got a, a, um, a image of that one. The story they did there. Now, the language in that is basically saying, you know, here this is not really about you know the, the authorities pulling, uh, uh, you know, somebody who's doing the wrong thing in business, pulling them up. Uh, and you know, telling them to mind their, you know, the way they do business. This is actually just an opportunity to say China is this really dangerous authoritarian, um, you know, repressive regime. That's you know, if the, right. if we can, can I, I'll just stop you for one second? Are, can, am I yeah. still coming through okay on your side? Can you still hear me clearly? Yeah. Okay, because yeah. you're you're yeah. you're really cutting out you're cutting out a lot. I'm not sure if it's I know you're on a satellite connection uh, because you're in a remote area. I'm not sure if it's the upload speeds that are really uh, cutting in and out. But I got like I got the gist yeah. of what you were saying on that. But it's starting to really cut out. I'm not sure if it will also be uh, uh, choppy in the final file. But yeah, All right. know, it, it, yeah. What, what I'll what I'll do with that? You have do you did you did an article on that one also the Jack Ma uh, on um, did you do an article on that in your blog? No. No, that one's that one's still to come, and it's going to be joined with the ca- the cartoon one as the same kind, Perfect. you know, the same kind of, of approach. Um, but there are others that I'm going to include in that one as well, because they, yeah, those agree. are the ones. That are, actually, I um, I may have done one with the um, already with the. With the cartoonist yeah. one. Well, what I'll, what, what I'll do uh, uh, is, yeah, if you I, do find it, I'll, I'll put it in the description afterwards, and then people can follow your blog and kind of follow what you're doing. Uh, what I'll what I'll probably wrap up on is really uh, driving home the point of um, this isn't just. Oh, actually, you know what? Just to pick up on what you were saying about America and stuff like that. I mean, America is the is the country that owns the majority of, of Australia's top companies. He has the biggest stake in these m- massive Australian companies. Uh, U.S. also has a terrible history of throwing their allies under the bus when it suits them. Uh, you know, uh, the U.S. is, is using um, the, the, these think tanks that are funded by them to uh, stoke up these conflicts between Australia and China. 
uh, China moves away from doing business with Australia and gives it to America. America becomes the beneficiary of this instigation. In many cases, it's the most ridiculous thing. Um, I, I yeah. don't know what's going on. I don't know if it's, you know, America is too ingrained into uh, into uh, Australia where they control uh, so much that it's very difficult to challenge, or if there's an underlying uh, xenophobia against China and the idea of China rising is just something that it says, okay, well, you know what? We know we're going to be screwed over by the U.S. Um, we don't know if we're going to be screwed over by by China, but I'd rather be you know screwed over by the U.S. than not know what's coming with China, even though there's no indication that there's anything coming. Uh, but the the media yeah. definitely paints it that way. But there's a lot of people in Australia, yeah. and I think this is worth mentioning too, because when I talk about America and I talk about Australia, I often get people in my comments, um, you know, after I talked to Robbie Bar uh, Bar Barwick also, saying that please don't think we're all this way. You know, there's some of us here. We really uh, we understand. We can see through it. Uh, but a lot of these, a lot of these people feel helpless. Like we said, there isn't that environment of free speech. There are consequences for standing up against these narratives. People don't realize it. If you don't believe us, just try it. Try doing it in any meaningful way. And it's not a matter of journalists going out and saying we can't find people from the other side. They don't exist. They're not speaking up. What can we do if they're not willing to speak up? This is a problem. No, they're actively a part of the problem. Now, Jack James, I'm going to share some of her blog posts because she digs into the media uh, really deeply as well. And she's uh, gone after, uh, uh, or really dug into Bill Bertels, uh, the guy we were listening to in the speech of how, what he does. And she labels some of the tactics he uses to spin stories. It's really, really brilliant. Um, but, yeah. What's interesting is that Jack told me a while ago that when she had far less followers, just in the hundreds, she wrote some articles pushing back against uh, the ABC. Um, or it was, I'm not sure if it was the ABC, but it was mainstream media in Australia. She didn't give me too many details and I didn't want to push too much. And she told me, she said, after she did that, she had somebody set up a, 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 a a, a fake a LinkedIn account started following her. And then the journalist under his actual name tried to add her WeChat also. Like she felt like she was being uh, it, w it, what I perceived as being stalked. And it was just weird hearing yeah. the story. She never told me who it was. And I was just like, uh, I wasn't sure what to think of it because she was saying this was a pretty high level guy also. And I said, I, I didn't say this, but I was kind of, I got to be honest. I was kind of skeptical. I was like, okay, maybe just being a little bit paranoid. You put it out there. You were nervous. And, and all of a sudden you're looking for this to, to happen, this retaliation. So you're seeing it everywhere. Um, but still it was concerning, you know? Um, and then recently I saw her interacting with someone and here it is. It's Bill Bertels. And I noticed this on the bottom of this, uh, interaction. She says, speaking of blocking, you never added me on WeChat. So rude. So I put, I put two and two together and I'm guessing this is the guy that she was talking about. And I was like, holy crap, she was right. This high level journalist, if I'm correct in my assumption here, I'm assuming that I, I can't imagine there were two different journalists trying to add her WeChat, although that's possible. Um, basically started uh, hounding her in a way, by the way, I think it's important to note the, the details that she gave me when she didn't tell me who it was um, in a way where I don't think they would have gone after a man in the same way. So intimidating this person with hard, a, a female with hardly any followers um, because of a pushing back against the narrative. So these journalists, not only are they not going, whether it was Bill or somebody else, uh, it, it, you know, these journalists are not only not looking for opposing opinions, they're working to shut them up also. They're working to preserve yeah. this narrative. Uh, it, it, yeah. it really is uh, uh, remarkable. And that's why, I, that's why I was asking you about the climate and, and your situation, where if you were still working, would you be more careful? And, um, uh, and, and how much worse it's become now with this kind of McCarthyism 2.0 kind of thing we've got going on. But I, I don't know uh, w w uh, if you uh, were reaching the hour and a half mark. So I want to just, if you want to wrap up on any thoughts and I'm going to, I'm going to direct people towards your blog also, which I, I, I I'd highly encourage uh, everybody to check out. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I think really if we, <laughs> if we pursued all the things we'd be here all night. Um, but yeah. look, Thanks for having me on. But, um, you know, it, it's it's great to sort of be able to finally, you know, put 
um, some of those those stories forward, um, you know, um, I'm I'm going to continue to to you know um, with those blogs and 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 that'll be you know my main mode of 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 um, talking about the media and specifically the ABC because I I, I do hold the ABC um, much more responsible uh, m much more um, responsible for the the way in which the narrative has been formed in Australia because they have been so actively promoting this anti-china narrative you know in, in a way that no not, you know other media outlets in Australia really um, have 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 not you know they're not doing interviews with aspie they're not they're not um, um, you know they're not the the balance of stories you know they'll have one um, anti-china they'll have one pro-china story but it's just this relentless diet where, where of of anti-china that we're getting from the abc at the moment and because it is a national institution and because it is something which is considered in australia to be authoritative the the fact that you know abc journalists and abc stories are so skewed, you know. I, I would. My thesis is that that's actually one of the major reasons why Australia is in such a bad position at the moment with with China, is because people are just believing the bullshit. You know, they're swallowing it all, and you know, they can they could probably fob off and say the commercial um, outlets. You know they're, they're a bit sensationalist, but they normally expect something of the ABC which they're not getting, and and you know I, I, I'm just making it my project that I'm going to come hell or high water, I'm going to hold the ABC to account for the way that they are reporting on China. I don't know anything about China; I've never been there. You know, I'm not a China expert in any sort of regard. I'm still learning about China from from you guys and and my new Chinese friends and from you know a, a bloke locally who has lived in China for a while. So I'm prepared to find out anything about China, but I'm not prepared to wear this kind of relentless propaganda from the ABC that is always so negative. And so they will get pushback from me, and it won't be. You know, it won't be flim flam. It'll be I'm I'm going to chop up their stories and show them where you know there's yeah you know you're, you're cutting out a little bit you're thing. cutting out a little bit right now. But that, I mean that is yeah. if somebody needs to do it. Um, you know, it, it, before it was the ABC holding uh, powers accountable. That uh, now there needs to be a, a second layer to hold uh, ABC accountable. It seems like. Um, and was it uh, just uh, uh, I know we're supposed to wrap up just I wanted to quickly confirm. Do you remember uh, there was a story in Australia? Uh, it was kind of an anti TikTok story. Was that was that ABC or was that 60 Minutes? Do you remember? Or do you know? Do you know um, what I'm talking no. about? Yeah, no, it was it, it it came in sort of incidentally in a story which was um, that what what the basic thesis was was that TikTok was a really bad influence on on kids, you know, as if so, as if every other social media wasn't. Your 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 upload uh, your upload uh, is isn't working. I'm not sure if it's going to be messed up in the final video. I didn't I didn't. Um, uh, if you want to if you want to type it into WeChat to me because I, it, it's cutting out too much. If it was a ABC or or not. Um, but anyways, I remember regardless of who it was in the media. I remember it was this rant against um tiktok and before it came out there were people on twitter saying uh, i can't remember who it was they said how much you want to bet they're going to put somebody from aspie on and then it turns out um <laughs> it was somebody from aspie and not only that the report <laughs> didn't mention that aspie before that anti-tiktok report about this national security threat threat was funded by facebook they received funding from facebook <laughs> to put this yeah. <laughs> report out uh, and yeah. uh, it was it was it was really ridiculous. But 
Um, your uh, your probably your download is working fine because you can hear me fine, but I can't hear I can't really hear anything you're saying is cutting in and out. Yeah. Um, so yeah. what what I'll do is I'll I'll just uh, from here is I'll encourage uh, people to uh, check out your blog. I hope this encourages other people to to speak up also. You know I think when it's it, it takes you know one or two people to stand up and take the brunt of the um kind of negativity that's going to come their way but once enough people start standing up and saying you know what let, let's you know th th there, there is something wrong with this and you don't need to have uh, know anything about china you don't have to have been gone to china to see that the way that they're doing this journalism this is about shoddy journalism is wrong it's not right you can recognize yeah. that without knowing anything about the subject matter that's how bad it is if you simply just pay attention and look yep. at how they're framing it, how they engage with the different sides, yep. or even if they try to engage with two different sides. But um, what, what, I'll, what I'll do from here is uh, I think, uh, I'm not sure if you're trying to fix your at the same, same point here. Um, and I wonder if it's actually on my side. Uh, but uh, for, from here, I just, you know, I, I, I want to thank you for, for, for joining me. And uh, also spending a bit of time with me while I'm here in my 21 day quarantine, and we will uh, we will catch up we will catch up offline, um, continue chatting sure. offline, and uh, I'll encourage everybody to go and check out your blog. That's for sure. We'll uh, we'll connect we'll connect offline from here. Thanks a lot for joining, uh, and uh, yes. thank you everybody else as well. Yeah, take care and chat soon.